Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week, we bring you two stories by Kathleen Norris, Poor Dear Margaret Kirby, and Dr. Bates and Miss Sally. Norris was a native of San Francisco. I enjoy reading her stories. She always references places I'm very familiar with living in the Bay Area myself. Norris started her writing career in the newspaper industry and eventually became the highest paid woman writer of her time. And now, poor dear Margaret Kirby. You and I have been married nearly seven years, Margaret Kirby reflected bitterly. And I suppose we are as near hating each other as two civilized people ever were. She did not say it aloud. The Kirbys had long ago given up discussion of their attitude to each other, but as the thought came into her mind, she eyed her husband, lounging moodily in her motor car as they swept home through the winter twilight with hopeless, mutinous irritation. What was the matter, she wondered, with John and Margaret Kirby, young, handsome, rich, and popular? What had been wrong with their marriage, that brilliantly heralded and widely advertised event? Whose fault was it that they two could not seem to understand each other, could not seem to live out their lives together in honorable and dignified companionship, as generations of their forebears had done? Perhaps everyone's marriage is more or less like ours, Margaret mused miserably. Perhaps there's no such thing as a happy marriage. Almost all the women that she knew admitted unhappiness of one sort or another and discussed their domestic troubles freely. Margaret had never sunk to that. It would not even have been a relief to a nature as self-sufficient and as cold as hers. But for years she had felt that her marriage tie was an irksome and distasteful bond, and only that afternoon she had been stung by the bitter fact that the state of affairs between her husband and herself was no secret from their world. A certain audacious newspaper had boldly hinted that there would soon be a sensational separation in the Kirby household, whose beautiful mistress would undoubtedly follow her first unhappy marital experience with another and it was to be hoped a more fortunate marriage. Margaret had laughed when the article was shown her, with the easy flippancy that is the stock-in-trade of her type of society woman, but the arrow had reached her very soul, nevertheless. So it had come to that, had it. She and John had failed. They were to be dragged through the publicity, the humiliations, that precede the sundering of what God has joined together. They had drifted, as so many hundreds and thousands of men and women drifted, from the warm, glorious companionship of the honeymoon, to quarrels, truces, discussion, to a recognition of their utter difference in point of view, and to this final, independent, cool adjustment that left their lives as utterly separated as if they had never met. Yet she had done only what all the other women she knew had done— Margaret reminded herself, in self-justification. She had done it a little more brilliantly, perhaps. She had spent more money, worn handsomer jewels and gowns. She had succeeded in idling away her life in that utter leisure that was the ideal of them all, whether they were quite able to achieve it or not. Some women had to order their dinners, had occasionally to go about in hired vehicles, had to consider the costs of hats and gowns. But Margaret, the envied, had her own carriage and motor car, her capable housekeeper, her yearly trip to Paris for uncounted frocks and hats. All the women she knew were useless, boasting rather of what they did not have to do than of what they did. And Margaret was more successfully useless than the others. But wasn't that the lot of a woman who is rich and marries a richer man? Wasn't it what married life should be? I don't know what makes me so nervous tonight, Margaret said to herself, finally, settling back comfortably in her furs. Perhaps I only imagine John is going to make one of his favorite scenes when we get home. Probably he hasn't seen the article at all. I don't care anyway. If it should come to a divorce, 
Why, we know plenty of people who are happier that way. Thank heaven there isn't a child to complicate things. Five feet away from her, as the motor car waited before crossing the park entrance, a tall man and a laughing girl were standing, waiting to cross the street. But aren't we too late for gallery seats? Margaret heard the girl say, evidently deep in an important choice. Oh, no, the man assured her eagerly. Then I choose the 50-cent dinner and Hoffman by all means, she decided joyously. Margaret looked after them, a sudden pain in her heart. She did not know what the pain was. She thought she was pitying that young husband and wife. But her thoughts went back to them as she entered her own warm, luxurious rooms a few moments later. Fifty-cent dinner, she murmured. It must be awful. To her surprise, her husband followed her into her room without knocking and paid no attention to the very cold stare with which she greeted him. Sit down a minute, Margaret, will you? he said. And let your woman go. I want to speak to you. Angry to feel herself a little at loss, Margaret nodded to the maid and said in a carefully controlled tone, I am dining at the Kelsey's, John. Perhaps some other time. Her husband, a thin, tall man, prematurely gray, was pacing the floor nervously, his hands plunged deep in his coat pockets. He cleared his throat several times before he spoke. His voice was sharp, and his words were delivered quickly. It comes to this, Margaret. I'm very sorry to have to tell you, but things have finally reached the point where it's... Uh, it's got to come out. Bannister and I have been nursing it along. We've done all that we could. I went down to Washington and saw Peterson, but it's no use. We turn it all over, the whole thing, to the creditors tomorrow. His voice rose suddenly. It was shocking to see the control suddenly fail. I tell you, it's all up, Margaret. It's the end of me. I won't face it. He dropped into a chair, but suddenly sprang up again and began to walk about the room. Now, you can do just what you think wise. He resumed presently in the advisory, quiet tones he usually used to her. You can always have the income of your Park Avenue house. Your Aunt Paul will be glad enough to go abroad with you, and there are personal things, the house silver and the books, that you can claim. I've lain awake nights planning. His voice shook again, but he gained his calm after a moment. I want to ask you not to work yourself up over it, he added. There was a silence. Margaret regarded him in stony fury. She was deadly white. Do you mean that Throckmorton, Kirby, and Son have... Ha, ha, has failed? She asked. Do you mean that my money, the money that my father left me, is gone? Does Mr. Bannister say so? Why, why has it never occurred to you to warn me? I did warn you. I did try to tell you in July. Why, all the world knew how things were going. If, on the last word, there crept into his voice the plea that even a strong man makes to his woman for sympathy, for solace, Margaret's eyes killed it. John, turning to go, gave her what consolation he could. Margaret, I can only say I'm sorry. I tried. Bannister knows how I tried to hold my own. But I was pretty young when your father died, and there was no one to help me learn. I'm glad it doesn't mean actual suffering for you. Some day, perhaps, we'll get some of it back. God knows I hope so. I've not meant much to you. Your marriage has cost you pretty dear. But I'm going to do the only thing I can for you. Silence followed. Margaret presently roused herself. I suppose this can be kept from the papers. We needn't be discussed and pointed at in the streets. She asked heavily, her face a mask of distaste. That's impossible, said John briefly. To some people, nothing is impossible, Margaret said. Her husband turned again without a word and left her. Afterward, she remembered the sick misery in his eyes, the whiteness of his face. What did she do then? She didn't know. Did she go at once to the dressing table? Did she ring for Louise? Or was she alone as she slowly got herself into a loose wrapper and unpinned her hair? 
How long was it before she heard that horrible cry in the hall? What was it? That or the voices and the flying footsteps that brought her shaken and gasping to her feet? She never knew. She only knew that she was in John's dressing room and that the servants were clustered, a sobbing, terrified group in the doorway. John's head, heavy with shut eyes, was on her shoulder. John's limp body was in her arms. They were telling her that this was the bottle he had emptied and that he was dead. It was a miracle that they had got her husband to the hospital alive, the doctors told Margaret, late that night. His life could only be a question of moments. It was extraordinary that he should live through the night, they told her the next morning. But it could not last more than a few hours now. It was impossible for John Kirby to live, they said. But John Kirby lived. He lived to struggle through agonies undreamed of, back to days of new pain. There were days and weeks and months when he lay merely breathing, now lightly, now just a shade more deeply. There came a day when great doctors gathered about him to exalt that he undoubtedly, indisputably winced when the hypodermic needle hurt him. There was a great day in late summer when he muttered something. Then came relapses, discouragements, the bitter retracing of steps. On Christmas Day, he opened his eyes and said to the grave, thin woman who sat with her hand on his, Margaret! He slipped off again too quickly to know that she had broken into tears and fallen on her knees beside him. After a while, he sat up and was read to, and finally wept because the nurses told him that some day he would want to get up and walk about again. His wife came every day, and he clung to her like a child. Sometimes watching her, a troubled thought would darken his eyes. But on a day when they first spoke of the terrible past, she smiled at him, the motherly smile that he was beginning so to love, and told him that all business affairs could wait. And he believed her. One glorious spring afternoon, when the park looked deliriously fresh and green from the hospital windows, John received permission to extend his little daily walk beyond the narrow garden. With an invalid's impatience, he bemoaned the fact that his wife would not be there that day to accompany him on his first trip into the world. His nurse laughed at him. Don't you think you're well enough to go and make a little call on Mrs. Kirby? She suggested brightly. She's only two blocks away, you know. She's right here on Madison Avenue. Keep in the sunlight and walk slowly. And be sure to come back before it's cold, or I'll send the police after you. Thus warned, John started off, delighted at the independence that he was gaining day after day. He walked two short blocks with the care that only convalescents know. A little confused by the gay, jarring street noises, the wide light and air about him. He found the address, but somehow the big, gloomy double house didn't look like Margaret. There was a Mrs. Kirby there, the maid assured him, however, and John sat down in a hopelessly ugly drawing room to wait for her. Instead, there came in a cheerful little woman who introduced herself as Mrs. Kippum. She was of the chatting, confidential type, so often found in her position. Now, you wanted to see Mrs. Kirby, didn't you? she said regretfully. She's out. I'm the housekeeper here, and I thought if it was just a question of rooms, maybe I'd do as well. There's some mistake, said John, and he was still weak enough to feel himself choke at the disappointment. I want Mrs. John Kirby, a very beautiful Mrs. Kirby who is quite prominent in— Oh, yes, indeed, said Mrs. Kippum, lowering her voice and growing confidential. That's the same one. Her husband failed and all but killed himself, you know. You've read about it in the papers. She sold everything she had, you know, to help out the firm. And then she came here. Bought out an interest in this, said John, very quietly, in his winning voice. Well, she just came here as a regular guest at first, said Mrs. Kippum with a cautious glance at the door. I was running it then, but I'd gotten to awful debt, and my little boy was sick, and I got to telling her my worries. Well, she was looking for something to do, a companion or private secretary position, 
but she didn't find it. And she had so many good ideas about this house and helped me out so, just talking things over, that I finally asked her if she wouldn't be my partner. And she was glad to. She was just about worried to death by that time. I thought Mrs. Kirby had property. Investments in her own name, John said. Oh, she did, but she put everything right back into the firm, said Mrs. Kippum. Lots of her old friends went back on her for doing it. The little woman went on in a burst of loyal anger. However, she added, very much enjoying her listener's close attention, I declare my luck seemed to change the day she took hold. First thing was that her friends, and a lot that weren't her friends, came here out of curiosity and that advertised the place. Then she slaves day and night, goes right into the kitchen herself and watches things. And she has such a way with the help. She knows how to manage them. And the result is that we've got the house packed for next winter and we'll have as many as 30 people here all summer long. I feel like another person. The tears suddenly brimmed her weak, kind eyes and she fumbled with her handkerchief. You'll think I'm crazy running on like this said little Miss Kippum. But everything has gone so good. My Lesty is much better, and as things are now, I can get him into the country next year. And I feel like I owed it all to Margaret Kirby. John tried to speak, but the room was wheeling about him. As he raised his trembling hand to his eyes, a shadow fell across the doorway, and Margaret came in. Tired, shabby, laden with bundles, she stood blinking at him a moment, and then, with a sudden cry of tenderness and pity, she was on her knees by his side. Margaret, Margaret, he whispered, what have you done? She did not answer, but gathered him close in her strong arms, and they kissed each other with wet eyes. A few weeks later, John came to the boarding house, nervous, discouraged, still weak. Despite Margaret's bravery, they both felt the position a strained and uncomfortable one. As day after day proved his utter unfitness for a fresh business start in the cruel, jarring competition of the big city, John's spirits nagged pitifully. He hated the boarding house. It's only the bridge that takes us over the river, his wife reminded him. But when a little factory in a little town, half a day's journey away, offered John a manager's position at a salary that made them both smile. She let him accept it without a murmur. Her courage lasted until he was on the train, traveling toward the new town and the new position. But as she walked back to her own business, a sort of nausea seized her. The big, heroic fight was over. John's life was saved, and the debt reduced to a reasonable burden. But the deadly monotony was ahead, the drudgery of days and days of hateful labor. The struggle. For what? When could they ever take their place again in the world that they knew? Who could ever work up again from debts like these? Would John always be the weak, helpless, convalescent? Or would he go back to the old type, the bored, silent man of clubs and business? Margaret turned a grimy corner and was joined by one of her boarders, a cheerful little army wife. Well, we'll miss Mr. Kirby, I'm sure, said little Mrs. Camp as they mounted the steps. And by the way, Mrs. Kirby, you don't mind if I ask if we may just now and then have some of the new towels on our floor, will you? We never get anything but the old thin towels. Of course, it's Alma's fault, but I think everyone ought to take a turn at the new towels as well as the old, don't you? I'll speak to Alma, said Margaret, turning her key. A lonely, busy autumn followed, and a winter of hard and thankless work. I feel like a plumber's wife, smiled Margaret to Mrs. Kippum, when in November John wrote her of a raise. But when he came down for two days at Christmas time, she noticed that he was brown, cheerful, and amazingly strong. They were as shy as lovers on this little holiday, Margaret finding that her old maternal, half-patronizing attitude toward her husband did not fit the case at all, and John almost as much at a loss. 
In April, she went up to Applebridge, and they spent a whole day roaming about in the fresh spring fields together. It really is a delicious little place, she confided to Mrs. Kippum when she returned. The sort of place where kiddies carry their lunches to school, and their mothers put up preserves, and everybody has a surrey and an old horse. John's quite a big man up there. After the April visit came a long break, for John went to Chicago in the July fortnight they had planned to spend together, and when he at last came to New York for another Christmas, Margaret was in bed with a bad throat and could only whisper her questions. So another winter struggled by, and another spring, and when summer came, Margaret found that it was almost impossible to break away from her increasing responsibilities— but on a fragrant, soft October day, she found herself getting off the early train in the little station, and as a big man waved his hat to her, and they turned to walk down the road together, they smiled into each other's eyes like two children. "'Were you surprised at the letter?' said John. "'Not so much surprised as glad,' said Margaret, coloring like a girl. They presently turned off the main road and entered a certain gate— Beyond the gate was an old overgrown garden, and beyond that a house, a broad shabby house, and beyond that again an orchard and barns and outhouses. John took a key from his pocket, and they opened the front door. Roses, looking in the back door across a bare wide stretch of hall, smiled at them. The sunlight fell everywhere in clear squares on the bare floors. It brightened the big kitchen and glinted in the pantry, still faintly redolent, of apples stored on shelves. It crept into the attic and touched the scored casement where years ago a dozen children had recorded their heights and ages. Margaret and John came out on the porch again, and she turned to him with brimming eyes. It suddenly swept over her, with a thankfulness too deep for realization, that this would be her world— she would sit on this wide porch, waiting for him in the summer afternoons. She would go about from room to room on the happy, commonplace journeys of housekeeping. She would keep the fire blazing against John's return. And in the years to come, perhaps there would be other voices about the house. There would be little shining heads to keep the sunlight always there. Well, Margaret, do you like it? said John, his arms about her, his face radiant with pride and happiness. Like it, said Margaret. Why, it's home. So the Kirbys disappeared from the world. Sometimes a newcomer at Margaret's club would ask about the great portrait that hung over the library fireplace, the portrait of a cold-eyed woman with beautiful pearls about her beautiful throat. Then the history of poor, dear Margaret Kirby would be reviewed, its triumphs, its glories, Margaret's brilliant marriage, her beauty, her wit. These only led to the final tragic scenes that had ended it all. And now she's grubbing away, who knows where, her biographer would say carelessly. Absolutely, they might as well be buried. But about seven years after the Kirby's disappearance, it happened that four of Margaret's old intimates— the T. Ellington Freries and the Josiah Dunnings were taking a little motor trip in the Dunnings' big car through the northern part of the state. Just outside the little village of Applebridge, something mysterious and annoying happened to the car, which stopped short, and after some discussion it was decided that the ladies should wait therein while the men walked back in search of help. Mrs. Dunning and Mrs. Frary settled themselves comfortably in the tonneau for a long wait, puzzled themselves a little over the name of Applebridge. "'I can just remember hearing of it,' said Mrs. Dunning sleepily. "'But when or how, I don't know.' They opened their books. A brilliant May afternoon throbbed, hummed, and sparkled all about them. The big wheels of the motor were deep in grass and blossoms. On either side of the road, fields were gay with bees and butterflies, Larks looped the blueberry vines with quick flights. Mustard tops showed their pale gold under the apple blossoms. Here and there, a white cloud drifted in the deep, clear blue of the sky. 
There had been rains a day or two before, and in the fragrant air still hung a little chill, a haunting suggestion of wet earth and refreshed blossoms. Somewhere near but out of sight, a flooded creek was tumbling noisily over its shallows. Suddenly the Sunday stillness was broken by voices. The two women in the motor looked at each other, listening. They heard a woman's voice, singing, then a small boyish voice, then a man's voice. The speakers, whoever they were, apparently settled down in the meadow, not more than a dozen yards away, for a breathing space. A tangle of vines and bushes screened them from the motor car. Mother, are me and Billy going to turn the freezer? said a child's voice, and a man asked. Tired, old lady? No, not at all. It's been a delicious walk, said the woman. The two sitting in the motor gasped. Yes, 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 lovely, the woman's voice went on. You and Bill may return, if Mary doesn't mind. Be careful of my fern, Jack. And then in German, aren't they lovely in all the grass and flowers, John? Margaret, breathed Mrs. Frary. Poor dear Margaret Kirby. I hope they don't go by this way whispered Mrs. Dunning, after an astounded second. One's been so rude, don't you know, forgetting her. She probably won't know us, Mrs. Frary whispered back, adjusting her veil in a stealthy way. Mrs. Frary was right. The Kirbys presently passed with only a curious glance at the swathed occupants of the motor car. They were laughing like a lot of children as they scrambled through the hedge. John a big, broad John, as strong and brisk as a boy, carried a tiny barefoot girl on his shoulder. Margaret, her beauty more startling than ever under the sweep of a gypsy hat. Her splendid figure, a little broader, but still magnificent under the cotton gown. Her arms full of flowers and ferns was escorted by two more children, sturdy little boys who doubled and redoubled on their tracks like puppies. The tiny barefoot girl in her father's arms was only a tangle of blue gingham and drifting strands of silky hair. But the boys were splendidly alert little lads, and their high voices loitered in the air after the radiant, chattering little caravan had quite disappeared. Well, said Mrs. Dunning then. Poor dear Margaret Kirby was on Mrs. Frary's lips, but she didn't say it. She and Mrs. Dunning stared at each other for a long moment, utterly at a loss. Then they reopened their books. And now, Dr. Bates and Miss Sally. Sometimes Ferdy's jokes were successful, sometimes they were not. This was one of the jokes that didn't succeed. But... As it led to a chain of circumstances that proved eminently satisfactory, Ferdy's wife praised him as highly for his share in it as if he had really done something rather meritorious. At the time it occurred, however, nobody praised anybody, and feeling even ran pretty high for a time between Ferdy and Elsie, his wife, and her sister Sally, and Dr. Bates. Dr. Samuel Bates was a rising young surgeon, plain, quiet, and kindly. He was spending a few busy months in California and writing dutifully home to friends and patients in Boston that he really could not free his hands to return just yet. But Sally knew what that meant. She had known business to keep people in her neighborhood before. So she was studiously unkind to the doctor, excusing herself to Elsie on the ground that nothing on earth would ever make her consider a man with frizzy red hair and low collars. Sally was a daughter and a dame. The doctor was the son of Bates' blue ribbon hair renewer. Awful facts against which the additional fact that he was rich and she was not counted nothing. Sally talked all the time. The doctor was the most silent of men. Sally was 22, the doctor 35. Sally loved to flirt. The doctor never paid any attention to women. Altogether, it was the most impossible thing ever heard of, and Elsie might just as well stop thinking about it. It's a wonderful proof of what he feels, said Elsie, to have him so gentle when you are so rude to him, 
and so eager to be friends when you get over it. It's a wonderful example of hair tonic spirit, Sally responded. There's a good deal behind that quiet manner, argued Elsie. But not the three generations that make a gentleman, finished Sally. Sally was out calling one hot Saturday afternoon when Ferdy, as was his habit, brought Dr. Bates home with him to the Ferdy's little awninged and shingled summer home in Sausalito. Elsie, with an armful of delightfully pink and white baby, led them to the cool side porch and ordered cool things to drink. Sally, she said as they sank into the deep chairs, would be home directly and join them. Presently, sure enough, someone ran up the front steps and came into the wide hall, and Sally's voice called a blithe, Hello! There was a little rattle to show that her parasol was flung down, and then the voice again, this time unmistakably impeded by hat pins. Where's the family? Did the gentleman come? This gave an opening for the sort of thing Ferdy thought he did very well. He grinned at his guest and raised a warning finger. Hello, Sally, he called back. Elsie and I are out here. Bates couldn't come. Operation last minute. What? Didn't come? Sally called back after an instant's pause. Well, what has happened to him? But thank goodness, now I can go to the Beavis's dinner tomorrow. Operation. I must say it's mannerly to send a message the last minute like that. She hummed a second, and then added spitefully, What can you expect of hair tonic anyhow? The frozen group on the porch heard her start slowly upstairs. Well, I might be willing to marry him added Sally cheerfully as she mounted. But it's a real relief to snatch this glorious afternoon from the burning. Down in a second. Keep me some tea. Nobody moved on the porch. The doctor's face was crimson, Elsie's kind eyes wide with horror. Sally called a final reflection from the first landing. Too bad not to have him see me looking so beautiful, she sang frivolously. Operation. Humph. An important operation. I don't believe it. She proceeded calmly to her room and was buttoning herself into a trim linen gown when Elsie burst in, flushed and furious, cast the baby dramatically on the bed, and hysterically recounted the effects of her recent remarks. Sally, at first making a transparent effort to seem amused, and followed it with an equally vain attempt at being dignified, finally became very angry herself. When Ferdy does things like this, said Sally heatedly, I declare, I wonder, I was going to say, I wonder he has a friend left in the world. As you say, it's done now, but it makes me so furious, and I don't think it shows very much savoir faire on your part, Elsie. However, we won't discuss it. Ferdy will try one joke too many one of these days, and then, now look here, Elsie. Sally interrupted her tirade to state with deadly deliberation. Unless that man goes home before dinner, as a man of any spirit would do, I'm going over to Mary Beavis's, and you can make whatever apologies you like. Of course he won't go, Elsie said with spirit. The only thing to do is to ignore it entirely, and of course you'll come down. Sally had resumed her ruffled calling costume and was now pinning on an effective hat. Her mouth was set. Please, pleaded her sister, inserting a gold bracelet tenderly between George's little jaws, without moving her eyes from Sally. I will not, said Sally. I never want to see him again, superior, big, calm codfish. Too lofty to care what anyone says about him. I don't like a man you can walk on anyway. She began to pack things in a suitcase. Beribboned nightwear, slippers, powder and small jars. Presently, grasping these things firmly in, she went to the door and opened it a cautious crack. Where are they? she asked. I don't know, said Mrs. Ferdy dispiritedly. I think you're very mean. The bedrooms of the Ferdy's house opened in charming southern fashion upon open balconies, over whose slender rails one could look straight into the hall below. Sally listened intently. What a horrible plan this house is built upon, she said heartily. 
Nothing in the world is more humiliating than to have to sneak about one's own house like a thief, afraid of being seen. Where's the motor? At the side door? Good. I'll run it over to the Beavises myself, and Billy can come back with it. That is, I will if I can manage to get to the side door. Those idiots of men are apparently looking at Ferd's rods and tackle, right down there in the hall. I can distinctly hear their voices. I wish Ferd had thought of situations like this when he planned this silly balcony business. The minute I open my door, they'll look up, and I'll stay up here a week rather than meet them. They'll go soon, said Elsie soothingly, as she removed a shoehorn from contact with George's mouth. I knew Ferd would regret this balcony, pursued Sally, eyes to the crack. Ferdy's not regretting it, tittered her sister. Sally cast a withering glance. Elsie devoted herself suddenly to George. Go down and lure them into the garden, pleaded Sally presently. Elsie obligingly picked up her son and departed. But Sally, watching her go, was infuriated to notice that a mild request from George's nurse, who met them in the hall, apparently drove all thoughts of Sally's predicament from the little mother's mind, for Elsie went briskly toward the nursery, and an absolute silence ensued. Sally went listlessly to the window, where her eye was immediately caught by a long pruning ladder leaning against the house a dozen feet away. Alma, the little waitress, quietly mixing a mayonnaise on the kitchen porch, was pressed into service, and five minutes later Sally's suitcase was cautiously lowered on the end of a Mexican lariat, and Sally was steadying the top of the ladder against her windowsill. Alma was convulsed with innocent mirth, but her big, hard hands were effective in steadying the lower end of the ladder. Sally, who was desperately afraid of ladders, packed her thin skirts tightly about her, gave a fearful glance below, and began a nervous descent. At every alternate rung, she paused, unwound her skirts, shut her eyes, and breathed hard. Please don't shake it so, she said. I didn't, said Alma merrily. The ladder slipped an inch, settling a little lower. Sally uttered a smothered scream. She dared not move her eyes from the rung immediately in front of them. Her face was flushed. Her hair was slipped back from her damp temples. It seemed to her as if she must already have climbed down several times the length of the ladder. At every step she had to kick her skirts free. Permit me, said a kind voice in the world of reeling brick walls and dwarfed gooseberry bushes below her. Sally, with a thump at her heart, looked down to see Dr. Bates lay a firm hand upon the rocking ladder. Speechless, she finished the descent, reeling a little unsteadily against the doctor's shoulder as she faced about on the walk. Her face was crimson. To climb down a ladder with him looking pleasantly up from below and then to fall into his very arms. Sally shook out her skirts like a furious hen and walked with one chilly inclination of the head for acknowledgement of his courtesy toward the waiting motor. Ferdy had promised Bill Beavis that you will spin me over in the motor, said the doctor a little timidly when they reached it. Sally eyed him stonily. Ferd! Why, I had promised Beavis that I would look in today, pursued the doctor uncomfortably. And when they telephoned about it a few minutes ago, one of the maids said that she believed that you were going right over and would bring me. I have changed my mind, said Sally. Perhaps you will drive yourself over. I don't know anything about motors, apologized the doctor gravely. Ferd told one of the maids to say I would. Sally said pleasantly. Very well. Will you get in? They got in, Sally driving. They swept in silence past the lawns and into the wide, white highway. A watering cart had just passed, and the air was fresh and wet. The afternoon was one of exquisite beauty. The steamer from San Francisco was just in, and the road was filled with other motor cars and smart traps. Sally and the doctor nodded and waved to a score of friends. I am as sorry as you are, said the doctor awkwardly, after the silence had grown very long. Don't mention it, said Sally, her face 
flaming again. That's my brother's idea of humor. I shall stay at the Beavises overnight. Oh, why, I said I would do that, said Dr. Bates hastily. I just called into the maid when she telephoned Beavis and said, ask him if he can put me up overnight. You see, I've got my things. Well, then I won't, said Sally. Her tone was cold, but a side glance at his serious face melted her a little. This is all ferdy, she burst out angrily. Too bad to make it so important, said the doctor regretfully. I don't see why you should stay at the Beavises, said the girl fretfully. It looks very odd when you had come to us. I am going to Glen Ellen early tomorrow anyway. I would hate to have the Beavises suspect. Then I will go back with you, agreed the doctor pleasantly. Sally frowned. She opened her lips, but shut them without speaking. She had turned the car into a wide driveway, and a moment later they stopped at a piazza full of young people. The noisy, joyous, beavis girls and boys swarmed rapturously about them. After an hour of laughter and shouting, Sally and the doctor rose to go, accompanied to the motor by all the young people. Ah, you just got in, doctor, said gentle Mrs. Beavis with a glance at the suitcases. Sally flushed, but the doctor serenely let the misunderstanding go. There was no good reason to give for the presence of two cases in the car. You look quite like an elopement, said Paige Beavis with a joyous shout. Put one of the cases in front, Bates, and rest your feet on it, suggested the older boy, Kenneth. As he spoke, he caught up Sally's case and gave it a mighty swing from the tonneau to the front seat. In mid-flight, the suitcase opened— Jars and powders, slippers, and beribboned apparel scattered in every direction. Small silver articles, undeniably feminine in nature, lay on the grass. A spangled scarf, which they had all admired on Sally's slender shoulders, had to be tenderly extricated from the break. With shrieks of laughter, the Beavis family righted the case and repacked it. Sally was frozen with anger. Mother said she knew you two would run off and get married quietly some day, said pretty, audacious Mary Beavis. Dearie, protested her mother, I only said, I, I only thought, I, I said I thought, Mary, that's very naughty of you. Sally, you know how innocently one surmises an engagement or guesses at things. Oh, mother, you're getting in deeper and deeper, said her older son. Never you mind, Sally. You can elope if you want to. San Rafael's the place to go, Sally, said Mary. All the elopers get married there. The courthouse, you know. No delays about licenses. They're very naughty, said their mother, beginning to see how unwelcome this joke was to the visitors. Are you going straight home, dear? Straight home, said the doctor. Well, speaking of San Rafael, pursued the matron kindly, can't you two and Elsie and Ferd go with us all tonight, say about an hour from now, up to Pastori's and have dinner? Oh, thanks, said Sally, trying to smile naturally. I'm afraid not tonight. I've got a headache, and I'm going home to turn in. Amid cheerful goodbyes, she wheeled the car and drove it along rapidly, pursuing thoughts of Beavis boys hardly short of murderous. The doctor was silent, but Sally, glancing at him, saw his quiet smile change to an apologetic look, and hated both the smile and the apology. They went more slowly on the steep road from waterfront to the hillside. The level light of the sinking sun shone brilliantly on daisies and nasturtiums at the roadside. Boats, riding at anchor, dipped in the wash of another incoming steamer. Dr. Bates hummed. But Sally frowned, and he was immediately hushed. Boy looking for you? He said presently, as a small and dusty boy rose from a boulder at one side of the road and shouted something unintelligible. Why, I guess he's for me, said Sally, in her first natural tone she had used that afternoon. But the boy, upon being interrogated, said that the telegram was for the doctor that was visiting up to Miss Sally's house. Dr. Bates read the little message several times, and absently dismissed the messenger with a coin, which Sally thought outrageously large, and a muttered worried word or two. Bad news? she asked. 
In a way, he said quickly. When's the next train for San Rafael, Miss Sally? I've got to be there tonight, right away. Do we have to stand here? Thank you. There's a case Field and I have been watching. He says that there's got to be an operation at eight. His voice trailed off into troubled silence, and he drew out his watch. Eight, he muttered. It's on seven now. Oh, and you have to operate. How horrible for you, said Sally, taking the car skillfully toward the railroad station as she spoke. But I don't see how you can. You've missed the 6.30 train, and there's not another until after nine. But you can wire Dr. Field that you will be there first thing in the morning. The doctor paid no attention. The livery stable is closed, I suppose, he asked. Oh, long ago. He ruminated frowningly. Suddenly his face cleared. Funny how one thinks of the right solution last, he said in relief. How long would it take you to run me up there? Forty minutes? I don't see how I could, said Sally, flushing. I can take the car home, though, and ask Ferd to do it. But that woman's at the hotel, isn't she? I couldn't go up there and sit outside, with everyone I knew coming out and wondering why I brought you instead of Ferd. Elsie wouldn't like it. You must see that... It would take us fifteen minutes at least to go up and get Ferd, objected the doctor seriously. And he's not much better than I am at running it anyway. Well, I'm sorry, said Sally shortly. But I simply couldn't do it. Dr. Field should have given you more notice. It would look simply absurd for me to go tearing over these country roads at night. Elsie would go mad wondering where I was. They were in the village now, troubled and stubborn. Sally stopped the car and looked mutinously at her companion. The doctor's rosy face was flushed under his flaming hair, and in his very blue eyes was a look that struck her with an almost panicky sensation of surprise. Sally had never seen any man regard her with an expression of distaste before, but the doctor's look was actually inimical. I feared that you would be the sort of woman to fail one utterly like this, he said quietly. I've often wondered, I've often said to myself, could she ever, under any circumstances, throw off that pretty baby way of hers and forget that this world was made just for flirting and dressing and being admired? By George, I see you can't. Well, now, whom can I get to take me up there within the hour? He appeared to ponder. Sally sat as if stupefied. Don't resent what I say when I'm upset, said the doctor absently. You can't help your limitations. I can't help mine. I see a young woman. She's just lost a little boy, and she's all her husband has left. I see her dying because we're too late. You see a few empty-headed women saying that Sally Reed actually went driving alone, without her dinner, for three hours, with a man she hardly knew. I am not blaming you. You have never pretended to be anything but what you are. I blame myself for hoping, thinking. But by George, you'd be an utter dead weight on a man if it was ever up to you to face an epidemic or run a risk or do one-twentieth of the things that those very ancestors of yours that you're so proud of used to do. Sally set her teeth. She leaned from the car to summon a small girl loitering on the road. You're one of the white children, aren't you? she said to the child. I want you to go to Mrs. Ferdy Potter's house and tell Mrs. Potter that her sister won't be home for several hours and that I'll explain later. Now, said Sally, turning superbly to the doctor. Put your hat down tight. We're going fast. They were three miles farther on their way before he saw that her little chin was quivering and great tears were running down her small face. Time was precious, but for a few memorable moments, they stopped the car again. Miss Sally and Dr. Bates returned to the sleepy and excited Ferdies at one o'clock that night. The light that never was on land or sea glittered in Sally's wonderful eyes. The doctor was white, shaken, and radiant. Sally flew to her sister's arms. 
We waited to see, and she came out of it, and she has a fair fighting chance, said Sally joyously, and the look she gave her doctor made Elsie's heart rise with a bound. Runaways, said Elsie, come in and eat. I never knew a serious operation to have such a cheering effect on anyone before. It all went so well, said Sally contentedly, over chicken and ginger ale. But, Elsie, such fun, she burst out, her dimples suddenly again in view. I am disgraced forever. After we had done everything to make the beavis crowd think we were eloping, what did we do but run into the whole crowd at San Anselmo? I wish you could have seen their faces. We had said we couldn't possibly go, and we were going too fast to stop and explain. We'll explain tomorrow, said the doctor, so significantly that Ferdy rose instantly to grasp his hand, and Elsie fell again upon Sally as if she had never kissed her before. Not... Not really, gasped Elsie, turning radiantly from one to the other. Oh, really, said Sally, with her prettiest color. He despises me, but he will take the case anyway, and he has done nothing but mortify and enrage me all day. But I feel that I should miss it if it stopped. So we are going to sacrifice our lives to each other. Isn't it edifying and beautiful of us? We'll tell you all about it tomorrow. Jam, Sam? And those are our stories for this evening. I hope you enjoyed Poor Dear Margaret Kirby and Dr. Bates and Miss Sally by Kathleen Norris. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.